Hello, everybody. Welcome to Seeds of Victory Global Bible Study. I'm Dr. Kenneth Hyatt, and this is Pastor Cindy Hyatt, and we want to thank you for being with us. Welcome to Home Bible Study. And uh, we're going to have a good time in the Word. I want to invite you to get your Bible, uh, get your notebook, gather around the table, because we're going to have a good time in the Word. And I want to invite you to uh, participate participate in the chat. If you've got a question, you got a comment, well, we just invite you to get involved because mm -hmm. home Bible study, that's kind of what this is about. Mm -hmm. This isn't just um, ministering a message. This is, uh, this is home group. Yes, and it is. so we invite you to get involved. And also, if you're watching by archive, I realize there are people that watch by archive in different places uh, simply because of the time factor. And uh, so if you're watching by archive, I want to invite you to contact us. Uh, go to seedsofvictory.org and uh, push on the contact menu and uh, just drop us a little line. Drop us an email. Let us know you're watching. If you'd like to join the family page, then you need to, to uh, friend one of us on Facebook and uh, tell us that you're watching the webcast and we will gladly put you on the family page mm -hmm. so that's what the family page is for it's mm -hmm. a it's a place of ministry mm -hmm. and it's a place of fellowship mm -hmm. and so anyway i invite you to do that and we've already got in house monty and beryl and uh, yoda yoda do not forget yoda and <laughs> yoda's the dog for those of you that don't know <laughs> just in case you and, were wondering uh, we're, we're like real informal and mahala is here and she left her dogs at home yes so <laughs> <laughs> and we're kind of glad about that you have what 15 13, 13 and, and three puppies. puppies so that's 16 wow and three cats two cats okay sorry exaggeration there <laughs> 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 yeah. And we left all of our cats at home. Yeah. But Yoda is here. So yes. and we're glad Monty and Beryl and, and Mahala that, are here. For those of you that don't know about Yoda, she looks like the reject from the Taco Bell commercials. She <laughs> is a Chihuahua. Not a reject. She and looks just like the Taco yeah, she Bell. She looks just like the Taco yeah, Bell. But not a doggy. reject. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yo, she she could have gotten a job. I said yo quiero <laughs> I said yo quiero Taco Bell and she growled at me. So <laughs> anyway, but welcome. Thank you for being yes, with us. Yes, we're glad you're here. And and the Bieras are here. Yay! Hey guys, I'm glad you made it. Thank y'all for being here. Is here. Good, 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 and good. And Diane is here. Wow. Diane, I want you to box up some of that squash soup you made. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you squash could, it. <laughs> <laughs> you could put that overnight. <laughs> I could have it for lunch tomorrow. Um, yeah. <laughs> not in Menard, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not in Menard. <laughs> All right. Got a good group. We do have a good group yeah. already getting started. I can't think of anything else we need to There's Miss Trixie Jo. Talk about. Hey young lady, I'm glad you made it. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. We've got a good group already. Yeah, we and y'all are gonna enjoy this. Uh, I think a few of you have already listened to the message from Sunday uh, that I posted on Facebook. Uh, you might have even had time to listen to it on the podcast. Podcast, put up the podcast this afternoon, and so it's mm -hmm. available. And this is really interesting things we're it's a different. Tonight. It's a different mm -hmm. thing. And really, next week, I'm really going to play with your thinking and theology if I go the direction I think the Lord's going to take me. And, and there's uh, Berlin. Hey, brother, I'm glad you made it back from Mexico. Yeah, we're excellent. glad you're home, glad you had a good trip. Excellent, was, excellent. Uh, all that you expected and hoped for and more. That's a good thing. I'm glad it went well, brother. I really am. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So let's hear we've about already, the temptation of Jesus. We've, we've got it. Man, we've got a good group. We do have a good well, group. Well, let's pray and we'll start. Father, we just come before you. We thank you for this time together. And we just thank you, Father. That as we begin to feed upon your word, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will be made manifest. We just give you the praise and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, yes, amen. amen. I want you to go with me, please, to two places. Let's go to Exodus chapter 21 
and also to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Go ahead and look both of those up if you will. Uh, Exodus chapter 21, 2 Corinthians 6. And we are still talking about the fear of the Lord. And we're going to delve into it a little bit more uh, tonight and look at some things. <clears throat> we're actually continuing from where we began uh, last week. Last week we talked about standing in your standing as a son. Tonight we're going to talk about standing in your standing as a servant. So uh, we'll get over into that as the Lord leads. We'll review just a little bit and then go into what the Lord has for us. Again, Exodus chapter 21 and 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning in Exodus 21, we've been looking at this passage a great deal in this series, and we'll probably be looking at it a great deal more before we get finished. But Exodus chapter 21 says, Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorposts. And his master shall bore, shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him for ever. Now, one of the things that we have already established is the fact that there is a direct uh, connection between servanthood and and the fear of the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12 says, And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? Secondly, one of the things we found out about servanthood, particularly here out of Exodus 21 in reference to becoming a bond slave, that's what this is talking about, servanthood is directly related to our love for God. Now you'll notice here in verse 5, it says, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, I love my master, my wife and my children. I will not go out free. So here again, servanthood is tied to, it is connected to our love for God. And then Deuteronomy 10, 12, where we just read, says, Now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy heart. So, now don't lose your place there in Exodus 21. Just hold on to it because we're going to uh, come back to it and, and use it as a point of reference. But I want to go over now to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Go over there with me, please. Miss Francis is here. Oh, good. I'm glad you made it, Miss Francis. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being with us. Awesome. She says, God bless our family of God. Awesome. For the word. Amen. Yes, amen. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 6 we also looked at this verse 14 it says be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness what communion has light with darkness and what concord hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of the living God as God hath said I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, verse 18, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 
Having therefore these precious promises. Well, what promises? Well, it is the promise of becoming a son or daughter of God. Having therefore these precious promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So here regarding sonship, sonship is connected to the fear of the Lord. But sonship is connected not to our love for God, but God's love for us. So servanthood deals with our love for God. Sonship deals with God's love for us. And of course, in 1 John 3, 1 and 2, you're all familiar with this passage. It says, Behold, what manner of love <coughs> pardon me, the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So again, here in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. So again, our sonship is related to God's love for us. And one of the things we got into last week, and let me bring this up to you again, is the fact that there has to be a balance between uh, sonship and servanthood. If you concentrate on servanthood, or if you have a church that concentrates on servanthood, Serving Jesus. We got to serve the Lord. We got to show Jesus how much we love Him. If you have a group of people or your, your walk with God is centered around that, then you will inevitably end up in a religion of works where you are constantly trying to prove how much you love God. And you end up, and actually that's the whole basis of religion. And um, I shared with you last week that we had a couple uh, come by the church a couple of months ago. And uh, they're missionaries to Mexico. We've known them since probably 2003, 2005, something like that. Uh, we've known them for quite a while. And they have a Bible school down in the interior of Mexico. And uh, they're originally from Ohio, but they're based now out of San Saba, Texas. And they dropped by. And we were visiting, and they made an interesting comment. Uh, they, they have an opportunity to deal with a lot of pastors down there, just because of the Bible school. And they said every pastor that they deal with, every single pastor that they deal with, their church either has a church service or a church activity going anywhere from five to six days a week. That's not just one church, but I mean, it, it, it is, it's part of a, uh, well, for lack of a better term, it's part of a culture uh, thing down there. There's a very strong emphasis on servanthood, and that's a good thing. But if you get overbalanced on the servanthood, again, you end up in a religion of works. I shared uh, Sunday that we were, that I think this is when you and I went down to Mexico. And uh, we were um, involved with a church down there, and, and Tony, you'll know it. Uh, Tony and Sandra will know it. It's it's a church called uh, Centro Vida in Reynosa, Mexico. Dolly Salinas back then was the pastor. I assume she still is. Um, at the time, they were running about five or 600 people, something like that. This was back in the mid-'90s. And we'd gone down there to do... A meeting and while we were there there was a church fellowship and of course we were guests and so they said you know you guys sit here at the table and we'll we'll serve you we'll take care of you and that you know that was great um, and one of the men in her congregation uh, he is a man that that at the time was with the Mexican version of the IRS he was with the tax people in Mexico, he came over to our table and he said, asked me, he said, what would you like to drink? And I said, well, I'd like to have a Diet Coke. 
And he said, okay. So he found out what Cindy wanted, and then he left. Well, we didn't see or hear from him for a while, and I didn't know what had happened. I thought, well, he probably got tied up working in the kitchen or, you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, he was gone for a good little bit. And then in, in probably, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, he came back and came to our table and brought me my Diet Coke. Now, what makes that interesting is the fact that at the, this particular time, this church uh, was a good ways out of town. The, the, the city of Reynosa had, had given Sister Dolly uh, a bunch of just scrub land out in the middle of nowhere. It's been built up around there now, but it's just a bunch of scrub land, and she started building an awesome work there. I mean, it's just amazing what, what was done, even in the time we were there. Um, but it was kind of out away from the city. And so when I asked for a Diet Coke, well, the brother went back to get a Diet Coke. They were out of Diet Cokes. But instead of just, you know, coming back and saying, would you like tea or would you like a regular Coke, which would have been fine, instead of doing that, he went out, got in his car, drove to town, bought me a Diet Coke, and brought it back. I'll tell you what, that's, that's humbling. It was very humbling. I was very honored, very blessed at what that man did. But that is... That is part of the, the servanthood mentality that's down there. It's just a servanthood. We're here to serve. But there is such an emphasis on servanthood that it ends up, like I said, where there's just one activity right after the other. Um, <laughs> I, was, I shared Sunday also um, back when we did our family meeting last year. Um, Margaret Aguilar, who is part of Cindy's ladies group, uh, she goes to the Catholic Church here, but she comes to a lot of Cindy's stuff and comes to some of our services. Well, she came to the family meeting, and we know uh, Butch and Margaret pretty well. And uh, but anyway, she came, and we were visiting after uh, one of the night services, and um, <laughs> they had just gotten a priest new priest in and for some reason they get priests from africa and they can't understand them but they get priests from africa and uh, she said you know she said the priest she said they bring them over here from africa and she said in africa the priests are like god she said the congregation does everything for the priest I mean, they wash his clothes, they cook his meals, they mow his lawn, they do everything for the priest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when she said that, I said, I think I'm in the wrong branch of the service. I need to, I need to convert, <laughs> I'm going to convert <laughs> to Catholicism and move to Africa. <laughs> but anyway, and, she, and I told her that, and she said, don't get any ideas. So anyway, um, we were talking about that, and she said, but when they come over here, she said, they are in for a real culture shock, because, and particularly, she said, like the priest here at Menard, it was like, go wash your own clothes and mow your own yard, brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this isn't Africa. <laughs> well, that's just part of the mentality that's just the way they are and if but if you get overbalanced on servanthood then you will end up in a religion of works yet on the other hand if you get overbalanced on sonship well i'm a son of god and god loves me and all that's absolutely true well i'm a child of god i'm a son of god god loves me god cares for me god wants me saved god wants me healed god wants me delivered god wants me set free absolutely all true but if you get overbalanced on sonship what happens is you get so caught up with the fact that god loves you you're not willing to do anything and it's basically kind of an attitude of okay god you want me blessed here i am get started and basically the attitude is, God, you're here to serve me. And that's out of balance. That's out of line. So you can get out of line either way. Mm -hmm. And so the balance of this is 1 John chapter 4, 
and verse 19. We love Him. Mm -hmm. We serve Him. We love Him because He first loved us. Amen. You could say it this way. We love and serve Him because we are first His sons. We don't serve Him as servants. We serve Him as sons. We love Him because He first loved us. The priority is sonship. The priority is God loves you, and God loves you first. That's the priority. But you have to keep that in balance in your service to God and realize we love Him because He first loved loved us so we've talked about that and we've talked about last week we talked about standing in our standing as sons and tonight we're going to talk about standing in our standing as servants so go back with me please to exodus 21 we got anything online oh uh, let's see robert's here hey brother <coughs> i'm glad you made it and burl says in some of the villages in mexico they do lots of church activities yeah but it has as much to do with the fact that there isn't much else to do in the evenings in yeah. those villages mm -hmm. in other words we're the only show in town yeah that yeah that's true too that that's the activity and so but and but the thing about it is a lot of those pastors even though they're the only show in town, the, the, the attitude of the pastors is, you know, they're not doing anything. Let's, let's do something. Mm -hmm. And so they take, you're right, but they do take full advantage of the fact that they are the only show in town. That's absolutely the truth. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Okay. All right. Exodus chapter 21. Let's read this once again. Exodus 21, verse 1 says, Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne born him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Verse 5, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. And for where we're going tonight, I want you to take note of a couple of things that are said here. I love my master. I love my master. I will not go out free. Now that's going to be very, very important for where we're, where we're going and where the Lord is going to take us. I love my master. I will not go out free. I was thinking about years ago. This was 40 years ago or better. Somebody came, somebody came to Brother Copeland and said, Brother Copeland, what do you think about once saved, always saved? He said, I don't think about it. I don't want out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. I will not go out free. So keep that in mind for what we're going to be get, get what we'll be getting into. Notice here, after that confession is made, and it's a public confession. I will hope to get into that later on. It's a public confession. Verse six. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or under the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now I want you to take note of this. This is very important. From the time that that servant, from the time he makes the confession, I love my master. I will not go out free. The very next thing that occurs is that he is forever 
marked in his ears. Now, the reason that that's done is because it is a statement and it is a sign that from that time forward, from that moment forward, for the rest of that servant's life, the voice of the master takes priority over everything. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. From the time that that confession is made, the voice of the master takes priority over everything. The Lord's bringing this up in my spirit. That, whether you realize it or not, you said exactly the same thing. You didn't use those words because you probably weren't even taught this. But you used different words. But you said essentially exactly the same thing when you said, Jesus, I make you Lord over my life. That's exactly what that means. Now, most people don't realize that. And it's been watered down of, you know, come get saved and come receive Jesus as your Lord with no idea or concept of what that means. Most people have received Jesus as their Savior, which is great, but very few have received Him as their Lord. And what is taking place here is this man is bowing his knee to that Master and saying, You are my Lord. And again, from that moment forth, the voice of the master takes priority over everything. And everything in that servant's life is subordinate mm -hmm. to one question. And that one question is, what has my master said? Period. The ear of that servant is tuned to the voice of the master like a radio frequency and you don't pick up or listen to anything else. The priority is the voice of the master. Very important. Now we got anything? Mm -mm. Now, <clears throat> we were talking just a second ago about um, sonship and servanthood. We recognize that when Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, most people understand that that baptism was a baptism of sonship. And don't misunderstand me, he was already the Son of God, but this was a baptism of, of power. It was a baptism in that sonship of power. And the reason that we know this is because you're all familiar with Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, Watch this, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So this was a baptism of sonship. But I also want you to realize that it was a baptism of servanthood as well. Because Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah chapter 42 in verse 1. Isaiah prophesied of Jesus being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he said, Behold my servant, my servant, whom I uphold. Mine elect in whom my soul delights. Well, isn't that, what, isn't that what the Father said? This is my beloved Son whom I'm well pleased. Well, here on the servant side, mine elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So the baptism that Jesus received in the river Jordan was a baptism of sonship, and it was a baptism of servanthood. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 3, please. 
Just go ahead and turn there. We're going to read what we just read online, but we're going to pick it up and we're going, we're going to go into uh, chapter 4. And when I was doing the notes for this, I did not plan on going the direction uh, that we're about to go. And I'm going to share some things with you that I have never taught before because I didn't know them. And I've never heard anybody teach what I'm going to share with you uh, tonight because we're going to go through the temptation of Jesus. And we're going to see how it relates to his being a servant. And I think you're going to find it very, very interesting. But we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 3. In verse 16, and then we're going to read into chapter 4. Do we have anything online? We're good? Mm -mm. Everybody listening. Did okay. You Kelly's here? No, good. Hey, girl, ben I'm Robert's glad you here. made it. Yeah, you told me Robert was here. Kelly and Francis. Wow, yeah, you told okay. me Francis was here. Good, good. All right, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. This is what we just read. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from, from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. One of these, uh, what I'm about to share with you, I saw many, many years ago. In um, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, here Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I realize that most of the people that I'm, I'm talking to through this camera, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you can remember your experience, if you can remember what it was like, many of you were, are like me and Cindy, many of you were baptized in the Holy Spirit years ago. I can still remember it. I was 15 years old. Cindy was 20. And we're both in our early 60s. And we can still remember what a powerful impact it was. And I should have been locked up. And they tried to lock Cindy up. So well, they, <laughs> they, they, did, the they kicked her out of the Baptist church. She was excommunicated. But I mean, cause you know, I mean, when when you when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, it is such a powerful experience, and um, you know, of course, this was back in the seventies, man. This was back when Jesus was like the highest high, man, and so <laughs> this was the high of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful thing. But I want to tell you, here Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he received the Spirit without measure. Now you can imagine what kind of a high he's on. You can imagine just the, uh, I mean, and here he is, perfect, sinless Son of God, receiving the Spirit of God without measure, no blockage to the power, no, no blockage to the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. You can imagine how wired he was. I mean, he was turned on to the max. But then we come to chapter 4. <laughs> then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, just for the sake of your understanding, when you go on a fast, particularly if you do a total fast, you're going to be hungry for a day or two or three. But after about two or three days, hunger will leave. Like I said, particularly if you do strictly water, hunger will leave. And I mean, food just has no appeal whatsoever. You might as well be eating a piece of cardboard. I mean, it just, just has no appeal. But what happens if you fast long enough, 
hunger will come back. And when hunger returns, you better eat. Because what is taking place, your hunger is returning uh, to your body. And if you don't feed your body, then your body will begin to devour its own organs trying to nourish itself and keep itself alive. In other words, Jesus was at the point of starvation at this point. Forty days and forty nights with nothing but water. My point is, here are, here are two experiences side by side in the Scriptures, and that's no accident. You got... Jesus on the high of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then you got Jesus at the bottom at the point of starvation. Both experiences. Now the thing I want you to realize is that as you read through here and read what happened to Jesus, the thing that, that stays constant or the constant in this whole scenario of highs and lows, the constant is Jesus himself. And years ago I saw this and began to realize this is how God wants us to be. Thank God for the high times. Thank God for the times when we're, you know, high on the Holy Ghost or we've been to a powerful meeting or, or had some transforming experience or God takes us to a new level. Thank God for those kinds of times. They're wonderful. But God never intended our Christian experience to be trying to live from one high to the next. I just want to go from mountaintop to mountaintop. That's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. As we go through life, we're going to have highs, we're going to have lows. But where we are to develop in our Christian experience is regardless of whether we're high or whether we are low, we stay constant. And I shared Sunday that one of the names of Jesus is the same. John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He is the same. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what God wants to bring us to is, in a, place, is to a place where we are the same. We are constant. And as I've shared with you many, many times uh, through the years, I've shared it here with Victory Harvest many, many times over the past 20 years. In order to come to that place, you must learn to live by your decisions, not by your feelings. If you live by your feelings, your Christian experience will be just one big roller coaster ride up one minute, down the next. But when you begin to live by your decisions of it will be this way, I will be this way, you become and you develop as a constant. Mm -hmm. And that's when, that's when you actually begin to get and develop a testimony. The, the, the biblical word for it is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. That's when you become mm -hmm. faithful. And so I want you to realize here that Jesus is going into this situation as the constant, and you and I must be the constant. Now, we got anything, or you got anything? Uh, Ungers are here. Hey, good. I'm glad you guys made it. Excellent. Excellent. So faithfulness is the leveler. Yeah, it is the leveler. It is the leveler. I was, every time I get over into this, I think about a, a vision that Brother Copeland had years ago. And he said, in this vision, Jesus was walking this straight line. Just, just walking this line. You remember that? Mm -hmm. He was just walking this straight line. Mm -hmm. And as he's walking this line, he is, he, you remember he's, the, the word says he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. He just walking this straight line. He is totally focused on one direction. And as he's walking... Copeland said, in this vision, he said, there was a war over here, and then there was something else over here, and then there was this political upheaval over there, and then there was this situation over here, and that situation over there, and Jesus was not moved by any of it. He just kept moving forward. 
nothing distracted him or deterred him from the goal, which was obeying the Father. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is how you and I are to live. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you something, you're not going to get that way, sitting there sucking off the TV on Fox News and CNN and paying attention to all that junk. I, You know, it's nothing wrong with being informed, but when it gets to a point where it steals your focus, mm -hmm. And you get off the line and you're going this way and that way and what about this and what about that? Turn it off. Mm -hmm. John, o John Osteen made the statement one time. He said, he said, he said, I quit watching the news and he said, you guys went through seven or eight crises I never even knew existed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Someone came by the house today and they were talking about some political things and some stuff going on in our nation and she said what do you think and I said truthfully I don't know I don't watch the news I don't listen to it I don't follow it on any feed don't know and I'm not going to get caught up in it I said I'm going to pray that's it and I said I've heard just enough about that situation to know that it's pretty bad and she tried to express to me how serious it really is. And, and I, I thought, you know, I'm sure it is very serious, but that's not where my focus is. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry it's happening. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be remedied for the good of those who mm -hmm. need intervention. Right. But I'm not going to get caught up in it. Mm -hmm. We watched a video talking about prayer we watched a video you can watch it on youtube it's uh the title of it is reese howells and the the bible college of wales that's the title of the video i would encourage you it's about an hour long it's a kind of a documentary thing uh, reese howells it's a long story but he he started the bible college of wales and uh, powerful man of god powerful intercessor and just to give you an idea, he was he he was around during World War II. Of course, he was a British citizen, and he had a group of people in this Bible college. And when World War II started, they were around, they were it was around the clock in shifts. They prayed twenty four hours a day in a room called the Blue Room. And they, they would pray and intercede regarding the war and for Hitler to be stopped. And what happened as they were praying, I'm sure God used other people, but he would use Brother, Brother Reese. Um, as they were praying, God would show him what Hitler was thinking. He would show him what the, what the German generals were planning to do. And he would write it out on paper. They're going to do this, they're going to do this, and they're going to do this. And they would start praying against that. And start praying for God to move and Hitler's mind and thinking to be changed. And um, they, would, they would start praying and they would pray and then God would give them the victory and they'd begin to rejoice and then they would read the next morning in the paper Here's what started to happen, and here's what happened, and they already had it in prayer. Mm -hmm. And if, if memory serves me correctly, it got to a point to where um, he was in communication with Churchill, and he would communicate to Churchill, here's what's, here's what's going on, mm -hmm. and go from there. I mean, God was, God was revealing the German battle plans. The point is, is exactly what you're saying. Stay focused on prayer. Prayer is what will change things. Prayer is what will make things right instead of sitting there getting all frustrated and throwing up your hands and, oh, my God, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back to the vision that Brother Copeland had of Jesus just keeping his focus and continuing forward. Um, you remember the vision I had back in, this was 91, 92 possibly, of we were having some people in the congregation that weren't happy. They were not pleased with 
me or you or both and you know all of the above all, yeah <laughs> and, you know we weren't doing things right we didn't know enough we weren't spiritual enough we you know we weren't whatever they were expecting us to be mm-hmm. and so people we'll were, talk about that in a minute uh people were doing a lot of talking mm-hmm. and a few people had left the church because we just weren't their cup of tea anymore we weren't spiritual enough we weren't spiritual enough and all that kind of stuff going on, you know, and it it, it happens. But anyway, and I, so I was really distressed over that. I really was upset over it, and a couple of families had left the church, and, you know, and I was trying to figure out what can I do to communicate with them and let's get this figured out and get them back at church and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So I was sitting at my desk praying and, and uh, talking to the Lord about all of this, and I had a vision. And it was a straight railroad track. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I saw these other railroad tracks that came circular across that one straight railroad track. And I said, what is that? And the Lord said, you stay on track. Mm-hmm. You keep moving forward and you stay on track. Those that I have ordained to be with you will come back around. And those that I have not ordained to be with you, you don't need them anyway. Oh, well, that was simple. Mm-hmm. I don't have to call anybody and beg them to come back to church. Mm-hmm. I don't have to call and beg their forgiveness for not being what they want. We quit to be. chasing people a long time yeah. ago. Uh, it completely set me free. I got up out of my tear-stained... <laughs> my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got up and it was taken care of. One simple yeah. vision. But the point was, you just keep moving forward. You could just keep your focus. Yeah. Let me take care of the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Let me take care of that. Because there are people that you don't want to be connected with you, not because they're wrong or you're wrong. Mm-hmm. They're out of place. Mm-hmm. You taught years ago about staying in your lane, staying in your grace. And if you get out of your grace, you push someone else out of their place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so set mm-hmm. your focus and stay on track. <laughs> Makes me think years ago, Rod Parsley was crying over people leaving his church or people leaving my church oh and he had a huge church mm-hmm. people are leaving my church oh they're leaving my church so he went to his spiritual father lester sumrall and said people are leaving my church what am i going to do and lester said every living organism has a bowel movement and he said he said well what am I supposed to do? He said, flush and move on. <laughs> <laughs> and that sounds hard. It sounds hard. It sounds, it sounds harsh. like you don't have any... Comp- no, that's not true. But if you stop to clean up all the little messes that everybody are upset about. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, years ago, the thing, that, the thing that cured me in that regard, you'll notice Jesus didn't chase down the rich young ruler. Mm-hmm. He let him leave. Mm-hmm. He didn't, oh, now wait a minute, you didn't understand, bless your heart, don't walk come, away. Come back, come back, let me explain this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Uh, changing the subject just a tad, Denny says, Mom, uh, Mom's test came back all clear, no cancer, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. She still has to go through radiation, though. Oh, mm-hmm. I believe, wish they would not do that. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to continue to believe God with yes. her and with y'all. Yeah. Um, let's see, Biera says, now throughout the whole of his work as a servant, he appeared very diligent and constant. Yeah, yes. you're absolutely uh, right, brother. Trixie Joe says, I loathe TV. Social media is getting just as bad. I've finally come to the place where I won't worry about it, and I trust God to make sure that his people are okay. Mm-hmm. Um, not worry about what the news is saying. Um. Pray. Pray. Because the truth is, you don't know what is truth and what is lie. You're going to have to find it out from the Holy Ghost anyway. Mm -hmm. 
And so rather than get caught up in it and get all upset and get over into anxiety and worry and all that kind of business, just believe God. Mm -hmm. Just pray and believe God. Mm -hmm. Stay in peace. Mm -hmm. That's that, our part. That we, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable, peaceable life, life in all godliness and honesty. Yes, amen. Amen. Okay, that's it. All right, we good? All yeah. right. Robert says amen about something. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, um, first of all, your theology needs to make room for that. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, it's interesting because, hold your place there in Matthew chapter 4, go over to Matthew 6, just flip over a couple of pages to the right. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, you all know it. Verse 9, After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Yeah, I'm going to believe that part. Lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, years ago, I was faced with the issue of trying to figure out how do you reconcile those two statements. Matthew 4, 1, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil. Yet Jesus, in teaching on prayer, said, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, one of the things that made this worse <laughs> is the fact that when you read it in the Greek, it's stronger than in the King James. Because in the King James, all of these statements are requests. Uh, you know, give us this day our daily bread. So they're requests. But when you read it in the Greek, they are not requests. They are confessions of faith. This is a topical outline of confession. What it says in the literal Greek is, After this manner, therefore, pray ye our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Come thy kingdom. Be done thy will. As it is in heaven, so in earth. You will give us this day our daily bread and you will forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and you will not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen well now that made it worse <laughs> because he said in the, in the Greek, you will not lead us into temptation, but yet we got Matthew 4, 1, where it says Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So now that made matters worse. Now at the time, I was in my early 20s when I was looking at this, and here's the astute theological conclusion that I came to, okay? It sounded good on paper, but bear in mind, I was only 23, 24 years old, so keep that in mind. <laughs> but I came to the conclusion, well, <laughs> Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit so that we would not have to go. You know what? That's not only wrong, that's dumb. That's dumb. And like I said Sunday morning, if you don't think God will lead you into a hard place, if you don't think God will lead you into the wilderness, you've only been walking with God 30 minutes or you've never lived in Menard, one of the two. Because God will lead you into hard places. 
Well, the question is, how do we reconcile these two verses of Scripture? Well, I started looking, and this is a couple of years after I came to that conclusion. I was looking at it again. And uh, looking at it in the Greek, in verse 13, says, You will not lead us into temptation. That word lead there means to lead to a destination. To lead to a destination. And it's a different Greek word than what is used in Matthew 4.1. Matthew 4.1 is just simply the word for being led. But here it is a, it is a Greek word that means to lead to a destination. In other words... What he's saying here is you will not lead us into temptation as our final destination. Lord, you may lead us into a hard place, but we're not going to die there. We're not going to camp there. We're not going to stay there. We are going to go through that test. We are going to go through that trial. We're going to go through that temptation. And we are going to come out on the other side victorious. You may lead us into a hard place, but the hard place is not the final destination. The final destination is victory. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Mm -hmm. And so, there are times that God will lead us into hard places. But it's, it's, it is not for the intent that we stay there. Now, I, I made reference to this Sunday, so I'll share it with you. There are times when God will, well, let me back up and put it, to, put it this way. If you look at the life of Abraham, um, Abe, God spoke to Abraham, said, I'm going to take you into this promised land. It is a land that I will show you. I will take you to it. Leave your house. Leave your father's house. Leave your kindred. So on. And so God brings Abraham into the promised land. Now, in this situation, God had already spoken to Abraham and said, You are a blessed man. You are blessed through you all the families of the earth will be blessed, and you are blessed in order to be a blessing. And then he said he brought him into, this, the, into the land, and when he brought him into the land, he brought him there during one of the worst famines that, have, that has ever been experienced in that area of the world. And it's like, okay, God, this is, this is the promised land. This is what I get. Everything here is dying. It can't even support me. I'm, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And you brought me here. This is the this, blessing. This is, this, is, <laughs> yeah, this is what you promised? you got to be kidding, God. And in fact, in, in, that was in Genesis 12 and Genesis 13. It's so bad, Moses, or excuse me, Abraham goes and sojourns in Egypt. He got the heck out of Dodge. He went to Egypt. And got in trouble down there. But anyway. Say well why would God do that? Well there are times when God will lead you in a, into a particular place. And if the blessing of God is on you. What God wants you to do is take the blessing and change your environment. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from experience it's doable. Mm -hmm. It's doable. Because we're, we, th this city is not an easy city. It's not an easy place. It's not even a city. But it, it's, it's a hard place. Then we don't even have a Walmart. I mean, how bad can it get? We but any, have a we family, have family dollar. dollar. Okay. So but anyway. Don't be putting it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in an, yeah, in a, yeah, in an orange and purple house. That's Mahala's house. If you want to go to Mahala's house, it's the orange and purple one. Anybody can tell you where it is. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows. Everybody knows everybody where, knows where is. house is. But. Um, we don't go by addresses here. Yeah. Just FYI. Yeah. Nobody knows what their address is. No. Very few people. Seriously, when we first moved here, people didn't know what their address was, but yeah. they lived next door. Well, you know Miss So-and-so. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah. live right up the street from the DeAndas. Well, I don't know them either. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're down the street from the Hernandezes. Yeah. Well, I don't know them either. Yeah. 
That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Biera says, is the wilderness experience to shed some flesh? It is. And it, well, the thing about the wilderness experience, one of the major lessons is learning dependence mm -hmm. on God, that he becomes your, your source. Learning to trust him when nothing looks or feels like it could be remotely mm -hmm. God's will. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're trusting him with, I'm here by your ordination. I'm here by your design. I'm doing what I'm doing because of your instruction. Mm -hmm. When it looks like mm -hmm. this can't possibly be Couldn't God. Couldn't possibly be God. Mm -hmm. That's right. it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. He says, same with uh, Wilmer, Texas. Uh, family dollar <laughs> get, most, <laughs> get most of our money yeah. yeah oh yeah when we got the family dollar we might as well have gotten them all we mm. were so excited mm. it was mm. like yes <laughs> yep. so exciting yeah <laughs> we have a family dollar you were as nearly nearly as thrilled over the donut shop well yeah because i i whined and cried you know what god has a way of putting you in your place Sometimes by giving you what you want and cry for. Mm -hmm. And um, this was several years back, and I whined and cried and said, <laughs> why can't we just live in a real town? Why can't we just live in a real town? I mean, there's not even a gym here. Okay, like I work out. <laughs> Hello. Like I go to the gym. Right? Jim, Jim who? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so I'm whining about not having a gym because I go to the gym and lo and behold it wasn't three months. Somebody opened up a gym here. It's still open. Yeah. Well, in that same whining season. Uh, wanting to be in a real town, I said, we don't even have a donut shop. Okay, I wanted a gym and a donut shop. <laughs> I don't know what about that told me that that was a you real town. Go work out at the gym, walk over to the donut shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't buy donuts. We, I've been in that donut shop maybe three or four mm. times in the three or I four I think years. they've shut down now, I think. I don't know if they are or not because I don't go there. Mm -hmm. But right after the gym was put in, they put the donut shop in. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> okay, now we're a real town. We have a gym and a donut shop. And a family dollar. And, a, and I don't go to either one of them. And what was it you asked me? You said, as long as you're praying and asking God for stuff and he's giving it to you. I forget what it was. You wanted the Best Buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we could be a real town, could we have a Best Buy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in Menard? Yeah. yeah. What that did was put me in my place that God is going to keep me in my place, even if he has to have somebody put in a donut shop, a donut shop and a gym that I don't go to either one. Now, I know that sounds extreme and it sounds ridiculous, <coughs> but how I see it is exactly as I just mm -hmm. explained it. Stay in your place. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think you're a real town now, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, you have a donut shop yeah. and a, you got it made. a gym Amen. and a family dollar. Amen. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Diane says, right where we are right now doesn't look like we are getting out of here. Don't lose hope. Don't mm -hmm. lose hope. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Chapter 4, verse 1. Go back to Matthew 4. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, I want to start breaking this down a little bit. Back up here to verse 33, or verse 3. Verse 3 says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, 
Now, I didn't touch on this Sunday, but I'll touch on, the, on it here. Isn't it interesting that the Father had spoken from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, and Satan comes along and says, If thou be the Son of God. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. That, 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 that word from heaven became the point of doubt. Mm-hmm. It became the point of temptation. But I want you to realize that, that that statement, if thou be the Son of God, that was a satanic strategy. Now, I'm going to read this, and I want you to pay very close attention, and I'm going to read it because I don't, I don't want to, to miss, because this is, if you don't get anything else, get what we're about to talk about here. He said, if thou be the Son of God. But now listen. Spiritual warfare is not one in our sonship. Spiritual warfare is not one, or in other words, there's no victory, or the basis of our victory is not our sonship. Satan is defeated. Spiritual warfare is one in our servanthood. Let me say that again. Spiritual warfare is not one in our sonship. It is one in our servanthood. Satan coming to Jesus and saying, If thou be the Son of God, <clears throat> was a satanic strategy of distraction. Mm-hmm. It was a satanic strategy to get him off, of tra- off track. Listen. We talked last week about sonship. So listen. <clears throat> We stand in our standing as sons before the Father. We talked about that last week. We stand in our standing as sons before the Father. But we stand as we stand in our standing as servants before the enemy. Let me say that again. We stand in our standing as sons before the Father but we stand in our standing as servants before the enemy. Nowhere in the Gospels do you find where Jesus stood on his sonship to defeat the devil. Nowhere in the Gospel did Jesus encounter some demonized persons and say, I'm the Son of God and you have to leave. I cast you out. Nowhere did he do that. He did not defeat the devil in his sonship. In fact, when those spirits would cry out through people, they tried to magnify that sonship. We know who you are, O Holy One of God. We know who you are, Son of God. We know who you are. And he would tell them what? Shut up. Shut up. Why? Because the issue was not his sonship. The issue was his servanthood. We don't defeat the devil in our sonship. We stand before God the Father in our sonship, but we stand before the devil. We stand in our standing before the devil as servants. Let me give you some scriptures on it. James 4, 6 and 7 <clears throat> says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. There's your servanthood. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Again, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, what is that resistance in the faith? 
humbling yourself before God, standing in your servanthood, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So again, we don't, we don't defeat the devil in our sonship. We defeat the devil in our servanthood. Back up to verse 3. It says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made, may be made bread. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Listen to me carefully. This is another satanic trick. If you are trying to prove your faith to anybody, including yourself, if you're trying to prove your faith to your family, your friends, you're trying to prove your faith to the devil, if you're trying to prove your faith to God, you're wasting your time. He already knows whether you have it or not. Mm -hmm. Consequently, you will never hear God say, well, now, if you've got faith, then you will dot, dot, dot. Won't happen. He already knows. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to prove your faith to anybody, then it's proof you don't have it. And any time you have a situation where you have the devil or you have, you have these words hitting your mind of, well, um, if you really believe you're healed, then you'll throw your medicine down. If you really believe you're healed, you will throw, the, throw your glasses down. If you really believe this or believe that, then you'll do this. Any time you hear that kind of terminology, you are dealing with the enemy that didn't come from God now James said I'll show you my faith by my works now there's a difference between showing your faith and trying to prove your faith people that are trying to prove their faith are concerned about what other people think they're concerned about proving to everybody around them that they have faith. Mm -hmm. But when you show your faith by your works, you don't care what anybody thinks because you already know in your own heart and your own mind, I have faith and I'm going to do what God tells me to do. You can like it, you can lump it. You can believe I have faith, you can believe I don't have any faith. doesn't make me any difference. But regardless of what you do, if you don't believe it, just hide and watch. Totally different attitude. Mm -hmm. Totally different attitude. So again, if you have that kind of stuff particularly hit in your mind, and I didn't bring this up um, earlier, so let me bring it, up, bring it up here. I shared this Sunday. When Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, um, Hebrews 4.15. You need to know this for what's being done here hebrews 4 15 says for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are he was tempted like we're tempted yet without sin now you know and i know that when we're we come into a place of of temptation from the enemy satan doesn't show up with you know horns and a, and a pitchfork and say it's me no he hits our mind, mm -hmm. he hits our thought life, he hits our emotions. The battleground is in the mind. And this was a situation where Jesus was led into the wilderness to fast and to pray. And this whole scenario is the enemy hitting his soulish man of his mind, his emotions, and his will. He didn't see Satan physically. 
Satan didn't show up out there in the desert. It's a head game. Satan is a master of the head game. And it's a head game with Jesus here in the wilderness. All of this is stuff that is going on inside his mind. All of this is stuff going on inside his head. And so you need to realize that another thing that makes this very unique is that Jesus was the only one in the wilderness. There wasn't anybody out there observing what happened. So what we have recorded here could only come from one source, and that's Jesus himself. So that makes this very interesting and very unique. Now, we got anything? Trixie has a question before you get into that. Okay. <clears throat> so our servanthood has something to do with the armor of God? I don't know. My mind has linked spiritual warfare with the armor of God as opposed to who we are in Christ. I'm not sure what your question is, but if you will think about it, first of all, um, the anointing for warfare is, is our anointing as kings. We're made, we've been made unto our God kings and priests. Kings went to war. Priests did not. Kings did. We have been made kings and priests. And when we go to war, we go to war as kings. Uh, one of the best ways to think about fighting the enemy in our servanthood is remembering the knights of the round table. They were men of authority. They were men of, with authority in the court of the king. They were called Sir So-and-So. It was a title of honor and respect, but at the same time, they were in the position they were in because they were totally submitted to the king. They would give their whole life for the king. And so our warfare is under a king's anointing, but you have to remember that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we stay just like Jesus did here. Yes, we use our spiritual authority, but we realize that we are a vessel and a vehicle of that authority. And just like we read out of James chapter 4, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. We're not fighting him in our own strength and in our own ability. We are fighting him as servants of the Most High God. So in reality, in coming against us, he's coming against God, and that power flows through us as servants. So I hope that makes sense. We are simply conduits, but we have to stay in our servanthood. And part of the temptation here, and we're going to, in fact, this is, this is the next point of where we're going People get caught up in trying to deal with the devil. I'm a son of God and you've got to do what I say. They will on many occasions wind up trying to fight the devil independently of God. They will try to fight him in their own strength and in their own ability and in their own power instead of staying in that area of servanthood and submission to the Lord and realize it's the Father within us that's doing the work. Okay, she... Uh, restates says the shield of faith the sword of the spirit at all my understanding is that putting on the armor of God is a verb an action to take to defeat the enemy is putting on the armor part of our servanthood yes it is part of our servanthood because what we just read here in both James chapter 4 James chapter 4 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And you can read, the word of God tells us that we are to be clothed with humility. That humility is our armor. Mm -hmm. That's our armor. And yes, their weapons, I mean, it is the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and all those things. But what makes the whole thing work is humility. The humility is our undergarment. We are, when we put on the armor, we are wearing the armor. We are wearing the garments of servanthood. Even though it is warfare, it's still, we are still in submission 
to God. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, what kind of an army or military force would it be if everybody's out doing their own thing in their own authority and in their own ability? In order to make this thing work, there has to be submission to the highest authority, which in our case would be ultimately the commander in chief. But it becomes a matter of authority flowing down the line and everybody has to stay in that position of servanthood, obeying the Father, submitted to the higher authority in order to win the, the battle. Mm -hmm. So I hope that makes sense. Lucille said a little while ago, faith is what moves God, not the people who are watching to see if you have faith. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. It, faith is a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are... There are certainly telltale signs as to whether or not a person is operating by faith predominantly the confession of their mouth but at the same time man looks on the outward appearance god looks on the heart mm -hmm. and so ultimately it is it is a matter of you and god and you don't owe anybody trying to prove you have faith mm -hmm. you just don't robert says philippians 2 7 through 9 mm-hmm but made it himself of no reputation and took upon mm -hmm. him the form of a servant and yes. was made in the likeness of men. Mm -hmm. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient mm -hmm. unto death, even the death of the cross. Right. Wherefore God, God has also hath highly, highly exalted, exalted him. him. That's right. And given him a name which is above yeah. every name. That's it right there, brother. Uh, Trixie says, yes, thank you. That helps Lucille. Worldly, quote, wisdom says a servant is a lowly, ineffective individual because they don't understand the awesome authority that comes with being a servant mm -hmm. of God. That's right. That's exactly right. Amen. That's it. Is there anything else? Mm -mm. No? All right. Notice here again, verse 3. <clears throat> said, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Command that these stones be made bread. Now again, let, let's go back to what this temptation is all about. Actually, all of these temptations are related to one thing, and that is the temptation to get Jesus out of his servanthood. And he's saying here, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Here's the problem. Servants don't give commands. Servants receive commands and obey commands, but they don't give commands. Again, this is a temptation of the enemy to get Jesus out of that place of submission, to get him out of that place of humility. Now he noticed, notice it said here, command that these stones be made bread. Question, could Jesus have used the power and turned the stones to bread? Absolutely. Yes, that is correct. How do we know that? Well, we know, we talked about this a few weeks ago. We know, for example, that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told Peter, was it the will of God that Jesus go to the cross? Without question. But in Matthew 26, 53 and 54, Jesus told Peter, He said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Jesus said, I could pray right now, and my Father would give me twelve legions of angels. In other words, he could have used the power independently of the Father. That was the whole issue. The issue was not commanding the stones to be made bread. The issue was acting independently of the Father. The issue in the temptation was the issue of staying submitted to the Father. Even if Jesus died of starvation, the whole thing was an issue of staying dependent and staying submitted to the Father. And so in verse 4, Jesus said, But he answered and said, It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus was telling the devil, I will not command what I have not been permitted by my Father to command. Did you hear that? I will not command what I have not been permitted by my Father to command. There are jurisdictions of faith. And you cannot step outside the boundaries and parameters that have been laid out for you by the Father. It goes back to what you were talking about earlier about stay in your lane. Stay in your grace. And what Jesus is telling the devil here is, man shall not live by bread alone. I don't care if I die of starvation. I will not command that the stones be made bread until I hear from my Father to say it. And in John chapter 12 and verse 49... Jesus said this, he said, For I have not spoken of myself. He never said one thing that the Father didn't tell him to say. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Literal Greek, what I should say and how I should say it. Jesus never said anything that he was not instructed by the Father to say. And that's what he's telling the devil here. I will not command what I have not been commanded. And you and I have had many discussions over this through the years where uh, what I call knee-jerk reactions to situations and circumstances. People receive a little bit of teaching. They read a couple of Kenneth Hagin books, listen to, listen to a couple of Copeland CDs, decide they've got the tiger by the tail. Something will happen and they jump out and they start, you know, just quoting scripture right and left and in the name of Jesus and you've got to do that. <laughs> what we need to do in order to be effective, first of all, is back up and stand in our servanthood. Father, what would you have me do and what would you have me say in this situation? And then shut your big mouth and listen. Listen. Listen to the Father. Now, what you were going to say or do may be exactly what needs to be said and done. But remember, you're under authority. You're a servant. And this is so vital in spiritual warfare. People just bail off and start screaming scriptures and all kinds of stuff and going cuckoo and totally miss the mark. Just totally <laughs> miss the mark. We, I always think about when we start talking about this, we were in a meeting at, at John Osteen's in Houston. And this was in 1988. And Brother Copeland was ministering there. And it was, I think it was during the afternoon service when, when uh, caught on fire in the camera lights. Wasn't that when it was? Afternoon, sir. I, but, I don't know. But it, the, afternoon or evening. The, the camera lights caught on fire. And... Um, up on the ceiling. Yeah, up on the ceiling. Way I mean, it's way up, up in the, yeah, way, like up on towards the platform. And I mean, there's fire coming down out of the top of the, the, the lights and stuff up over the platform. And um, they had, the way the thing was built, the lights were kind of inset. They were built into a thing up, up in there. And so you couldn't really see exactly what was going on. And so I'm sitting there looking at that. And I thought, well, there'll be somebody to take care of that in just a minute. And I said, Father, you need to alert them and have somebody deal with that. I'm looking at that. Cindy's praying a little bit, praying in the Spirit. We said basically the same thing. In the midst of that, there were people jump, jumping up and screaming and hollering and pointing at the light. And I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And blah, blah, blah. I mean, just going crazy. And I thought, you're an idiot. <laughs> just, you know, man, just. But people are trained to do that instead of back off. Listen to God, and it wasn't two minutes. I think we said basically the same. Yeah, yeah. It was we a said, of yeah, we said, Father, you need to alert them and have somebody take care of that. 
I mean, just in about that time, some guy wheeled out there on the lift. Oh, I need wish I had a lift. Mm -hmm. Somebody wheeled out there on a, somebody wheeled out there on a lift and jumped on that thing, just Spoked sucked it in, just <laughs> yeah. It was done. It, it was. I mean, they literally did, cut the thing loose. Yeah. Replaced one, and it was done in like ten, fifteen minutes. Yeah. They were done, and then somebody came out after the lift went off, went away and somebody came out with the vacuum cleaner and they cleaned up all the mess down there and where the fire had you know fallen on the car I mean it was like that. it was like watching a machine everybody just working together and just yeah. doing their job and they just did their but job it, nobody was panicky nobody was yeah you know having yeah, a problem but, but except uh, this the, couple of rows of people that were rebuking and fire. casting out demons yeah, and everything and, else yeah. it was so Anyway. But it was done. It was done. Mm -hmm. So listen to the Father. Stay in submission to the Father. Find out what needs to be said. Find out what needs to be done. Don't just knee-jerk react. Now, react. I mean, I, and I know, you know, things happen, car wrecks and stuff like that, that in a moment of time something's got to be said and done. But in positions where you can, back off. Listen to God. Find out what you need to say find out what you need to do that's exactly what jesus is saying mm -hmm. is saying here now we got anything online robert said judo chopping the devil yeah that's a, that's <laughs> exactly yeah uh, judo Vera says john 5 19 yeah exactly yes yes exactly mm -hmm. i can do nothing of myself exactly mm -hmm. and so for this first temptation um, and what he was telling, again, what he was telling the devil was, did he have the ability to do it? Yes, but he did not have the permission. This first temptation was a temptation to submit to the appetites of his flesh instead of God. This first temptation was a temptation to submit to the appetites of his flesh instead of God. Now, let's deal with the second one. Verse 5 says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God. Again, he's try, trying to get the thing off track here. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Well, here Satan tries to quote a little bit of scripture. He's quoting from the 91st Psalm. But being the liar and the father of all liars, he gets the, he gets the quote wrong because there's no truth in him. Verse 7, Jesus said, said unto him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, again, this I don't know if this was a vision where he was taken to the pinnacle of the temple, or just thinking in his mind, I don't know. But it was predominantly a soulish warfare. Now, in going to the, taking him to the pinnacle of the temple, you need to realize that there were religious leaders around the temple, temple activity, 24-7. Why? They were trying to prove that they loved God and served God. But there was activity going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in going to the pinnacle of the temple, uh, basically, as you well know, the Jewish religious leaders had a certain idea and concept as to who uh, the Messiah would be and what the Messiah would be. Because what they were looking for was the son of David, king of Israel. The Messiah will come and he will defeat Rome and he will deliver us. And he'll be kind of this, um, this military superman that will come in and, and destroy the Roman overlords and exalt the nation of Israel above the nations. And through him, Israel will rule the world. Now, that was kind of their, their idea. That's, that's what they thought would happen. So here is Satan. 
uh, he, as it says, he takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. Well, you need to realize that the pinnacle of the temple, it was a 700 foot drop from the pinnacle of the temple to the ground. And basically what the devil was tempting him to do was, you know, if you, if you just jumped off the top of this temple and as you floated down and the angels showed up and carried you to the ground, then surely you would impress all of these religious leaders. And it was a, it was a temptation to impress the religious leaders to, and conform to their ideas of what they thought the Messiah was supposed to be. In other words, it was a temptation to fit into the spiritual box of the religious leaders of Israel. And I just want you to realize that, that when you start standing in your servanthood, and you make the determination, I'm going to obey God. And I'm a servant of God. I love my master. I will not go out free. And I am submitted to his voice. I want to tell you, you're going to ruffle some feathers. And the reason you're going to ruffle some feathers is because you will not fit in the religious box. And in not fitting in the religious box, you're going to become a nonconformist. And in some cases, you may even come off as rebellious and uh, a misfit <laughs> and all those kinds of things. And particularly if you're called into the ministry and people have an idea of what you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to act. And, you know, if, if well, if you're a minister, then you're supposed to dot, dot, mm -hmm. dot. And the truth of the matter is, that if we're called as ministers of the gospel, our priority is the voice of the master, regardless of what anybody else thinks, regardless of their religious ideas, regardless of what they think a preacher is supposed to be. The bottom line is we're responsible to obey God. Mm -hmm. And you and I were talking the other day, I was sharing with you, I'd been doing some study of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, you know, he was... His, he, he was from the tribe of Levi. His father was a priest. In other words, it was laid out for him. His life was laid out for him to become a priest. He, he was a Levi. He, he should have uh, joined the priesthood at 20, worked for 30 years, retired at 50. He would have had, a, a for lack of a better term, a cushy job, <laughs> retirement. Uh, job security, uh, all of the trappings and the perks of, of priesthood. And a lot of those priests were extremely wealthy people by this time. And uh, they, you know, the blessing of God, they, they were blessed and so on. But God deals with John. John, no, mm -mm, no, I'm, no, I'm not going to go that route. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness he left all the trappings of that behind. Don't you know everybody thought he was nuts? Mm -hmm. Everybody thought he was absolutely crazy. Well, you you got to be out of your mind. You, you're going to go off out here in the desert and men wear weird clothes and eat bugs. I mean, you're just a weird dude. Mm -hmm. But he had the call of the prophet on him. He had the call of the Nazarite on him. And so he went out and obeyed God. It's like our, uh, our friends in Ireland. Um, uh, the pastor in, in Belfast was a Hall of Fame soccer player, player. He is in the Hall of Fame. I mean, he was that good and played professional soccer for years for Belfast team. And uh, he shared with us when we were over there, he said, he said, Kenneth, the call of God was on me. God was really dealing with me about going into the ministry. And he said, I was seated at a table with two contracts in front of me. Each one of those contracts would guarantee me a million pounds for each contract and one mi a million pounds to play and a million pounds to coach. And God said, walk away. 
walk away. And he did. And God is blessing their ministry. He and his brother are ministering together while, while we were while we were in we were in Belfast in two thousand eight. And the Lord had given me a word that they were going to be ministering together and, and now they are. But it was kind of funny because the the pastor's name is Glenn Dunlop or Dunlop 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 mm -hmm. if you say it right it's Glenn Dunlop mm -hmm. and his brother from Texas is Dunlop Dunlop <laughs> Dunlop over your belt <laughs> your belly lop Dunlop over your belt um, but but his brother's name was Warren Warren Dunlop mm -hmm. well <laughs> Warren we stayed with brother Warren Sister Annette, while we were there, mm -hmm. stayed at their home, had a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> at the time while, he, while we were there, he worked for Mercedes Benz. And he worked in the parts department for Mercedes Benz there in Belfast. And he drove a BMW. <laughs> and he said, I asked him, I said, Man, what are you doing driving a BMW working for Mercedes Benz? He said, ah, those pieces of junk, they break down. I'm not driving one of those. <laughs> 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 but they were a lot of fun. But, I mean, total nonconformist. He had to walk away. So we got mm -hmm. something? Uh, I'm not <clears throat> sure what Diane was referring to here. Uh, she said witchy. <laughs> a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. uh, Trixie, me, a nonconformist. <laughs> Too late. Um, Lucille says, yes, Jesus was, quote, supposed to be a carpenter, too. Yeah, that's exactly right. Robert reminds me of Daniel in the lion's den, his servanthood and uncompromising spirit got him in trouble more than once. Mm -hmm. Lucille, so glad Jesus decided not to continue in the vocation his earthly father trained him for. Mm -hmm. Well, and particularly, Lucille, you bring up a good point. He was trained to be a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And uh, here he was, 30 years of age. And for all intents and purposes, we most Bible scholars believe, and I agree, that somewhere between the age of 12 and the age of 30, Joseph died. And um, so guess who the responsibility of taking care of mom fell to? He would have been the firstborn son. Mm -hmm. And so leaving the carpenter shop, well, you got your mama to take care of. Now, what are you doing, boy? You going off into ministry? You go off out there and go broke. You need to stay with your trade and keep doing what you're doing. You got your mama to take care of. You got these younger brothers and sisters coming up. You need to, well, you just, you're not taking your responsibility. So that's a good point. It requires you to step outside and be a nonconformist. Mm -hmm. And the temptation here with Jesus was a temptation to conform to the religious ideas and concepts of his day. Um, what I wrote down was that this temptation was a temptation to submit and conform to the expectations and demands of religion rather than to God. Now, I think it's very interesting when Jesus' response to that in verse 7, Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And as I said Sunday, the way that's worded is very interesting. A lot of people think Jesus was talking about himself, saying, Well, now I'm not supposed to tempt God. That's not what he said. He was telling the devil, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, get out of my face with that. I'm your master, now you get out of my face. Why could he make that statement, you shall not tempt the Lord your God? He was declaring his uh, authority over Satan. How could he do that? Because he was submitted to the Father. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Get out of my face with that stuff. So, the first temptation was a temptation to submit to the appetites of his flesh rather than the Father. The second temptation was the temptation to conform to people's ideas and religious concepts rather than obey the voice of the Father. And so now we come to the third temptation. We've got just enough time to deal with it. 
verse, verse uh, where are we? Uh, verse 9. Verse 8. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, You shall, know, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, was it the will of God that Jesus receive the kingdoms of this world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and, and there, was gr there were great voices in heaven. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So it was the will of God that Jesus receive the kingdoms of this world. And so the devil was offering Jesus something that God had already promised. But the problem was Jesus or the problem was Satan was offering Jesus a kingdom without a cross. And the problem with that is in offering Jesus a kingdom without a cross, then he would have been he would have had a kingdom that was founded on compromise. And I said this Sunday, and I, I heard this years ago from Rick Godwin, and it is the truth. He said, if a man puts the rod of authority in your hand, a man can take it away. The devil was offering Jesus the rod of authority. I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. Well, if the devil gave him that rod of authority, then the devil could take it away. Jesus knew that. And again it becomes an issue of servanthood. Who is the source of your authority? If the source of your authority is men, at some point, men can take your authority away unless you're willing to bow the knee to them and do what they want. Preachers all over the world are bound up in man's authority because, well, you know, bless the Lord God, we're the elders in this church and we put you in here and if you don't do what we say, we'll just run you off. And there's one church right now that I know of in, in Midland, Texas, that's pretty much that way. And they can't keep a pastor over about two years. Because the authority issue is they askew. Give him authority. No. They won't relinquish authority. They won't, they won't relinquish authority. They will, yeah, they, here's your authority. You can do what we tell you to do. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I told them. Yeah. And I've tried to talk to some people about that, and it just kind of went, no. But, you know, they don't work for me. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the principle behind it. If men give you the rod of authority, men can take it away. And uh, there are two things. Now, listen to this very carefully. I've never heard anybody address this the way I'm about to here. The Lord dealt with me about this Saturday. There are two things that describe Satan. One of them is pride and the other is personal ambition. Pride and personal ambition. And because Satan is full of pride and personal ambition, he assumes that all men are like him. And because he assumes that all men are like him, he assumes that men serve God for what they can get. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's a lot of truth to that. There are a lot of people involved in the things of God for what they can get out of it. Mm -hmm. But that was the whole argument in the book of Job. In Job 1, verses 8 through 11, you have the conversation between God and Satan says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed 
the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Why, sure, he's going to serve you. He's, he's serving you for what he can get out of it, God. But put forth your hand now touch all, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. That was Satan's argument. The only reason men serve God is for what they can get out of it. Pride and personal ambition. Now, there's a couple of interesting scriptures, and I want you to listen very carefully. A couple of scriptures, one of them is Deuteronomy 28, verses 45 through 47. Deuteronomy 1 through 15 gives the blessing of the law. From verse 16 through the end of the chapter, you have what's known as the curse of the law. And so what we're reading here is part of the curse of the law. Notice what it said, verse 45. God said, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till you be destroyed because you have hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded, commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever because you serve not the Lord your God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. God is saying here, you are to serve me for the abundance of all things. If you don't, you bring a curse. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now listen. If we confuse our position as sons and servants, if we don't keep those things in balance, if we confuse our position as sons and servants, listen how the Lord worded this, we will pollute our love for God and the desire to be blessed with the poison of personal ambition. Let me say that again. If we confuse our position as sons and servants, we will pollute our love for God and the desire to be blessed with the poison of personal ambition. We must maintain the balance of being sons and servants. If we do that, then we keep the right viewpoint and the right understanding of the blessing of God. Let me read this to you. When a person is poisoned with personal ambition, they will bow the knee to whomever will give them what they want. Say that again. When a person is poisoned with personal ambition, they will bow the knee to whomever will give them what they there are a lot of people trying to serve God for what they want. It's a selfish motive. Well, how do we keep the balance? Does God want us blessed? Yes, we are to serve God for the abundance of all things. For what purpose? So we can get what we want? No. We are blessed so that we can be blessed a blessing period we are a conduit of the blessing of God we are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others we are not you remember Jesus gave the, the story of the, the parable he said beware of covetousness and the, but the Bible says there was a man that had a field that brought forth plentifully well, how did, that bring, how did that happen? Well, the blessing of God was on him and on his field and on everything he had. It's God that giveth the increase. God blessed this man. But the man got over into personal ambition and he said, Well, I know what I'll do. I, I mean, I got more than I can possibly ever use. 
I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. And then that night, the Lord appeared to him and said, you fool. <laughs> said, tonight your soul will be required of you. Now, whose will these things be? The guy missed the point. If the man would have said, you know what? I've got more than enough right here. I mean, I've just got way plenty. I'm going to start sowing into other people's lives. He had been blessed in order to be a blessing. But when he got over into personal ambition, I'm going to build bigger barns. Now that's the difference. And as long as we keep sonship and servanthood in proper perspective, we are blessed as sons so that we can be a blessing. Serve. You follow that? That makes sense? So, we have to keep that in proper perspective. This third temptation was this temptation was the temptation to submit to personal ambition rather than to God. I'm in this for what I can get out of it. And unfortunately, there are men and women in the ministry that they are there for one reason, and that is to build themselves a kingdom. Bigger, bigger, bigger. For what purpose? Well, so we can be a bigger, mm -hmm. have a bigger this and a bigger that and a larger this and a larger that. And it's not about people. It's about numbers and it's about having a staff and being bigger and being impressive and being... All of these things becomes about personal ambition. It's a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. So in these three temptations, again, they're all about servanthood. It was the temptation, first one, temptation to submit to appetites rather than to God. The second one was a temptation to submit to people's ideas and concepts rather than to God. Thirdly was the temptation to submit to personal ambition rather than to God. And I want to tell you something. You're going to serve God and walk with God. Personal ambition goes on the cross. It just goes on the cross. Will God promote you? Absolutely. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So, what happened after that? Well, verse 11 then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. When Jesus stood on his servanthood, it released angelic activity. I think one of the reasons we haven't seen more operations of angels than what we have is because we have not stood in our servanthood. Angels are servants of God on one level. Men are to serve God. And God and angels are to work together to get the will of God done in the earth. But when you have men not standing in servanthood, they block the function and operation of angels. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus, when Jesus made that statement and he quoted um, verse 10, says, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He was quoting part of Deuteronomy 6.13, which says, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall swear by his name. So again, we come back full circle. Stand in our servanthood, and our servanthood is rooted in the fear of the Lord. Amen. So, I think that's it for tonight. Excellent Glory to God. Word. Praise God. Excellent word. Praise God. The Lord is good. Yes, he is. Thank you all once again. For thank you. Yes, thank you for being with us. evening to sit with us around the table and hear what the Spirit of God has for us. We mm -hmm. appreciate yes, each we do. one of you. Mm -hmm. uh, our in-house folks, thank you all. As always, yes. we appreciate you being here. Even Yoda. Even Yoda. Yoda was good. She was nice. <laughs> she made no noise. She didn't bark. <laughs> She's snoring. <laughs> I heard I heard her squeaky toy, so um but it is a blessing to have you all Amen. join us. Yes, it is. Each and every one of you are a blessing. Thank you for being a part of what God has instructed us to do and given us 
the assignment mm -hmm. to reach the world from Menard, and you're helping us to yes, do that. Yes, you and are. We appreciate it. Amen. Um, continue Amen. to pray for us, please. Yes. Um, we pray for y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. Uh, uh, I pray for you. You pray for me. Uh, if you pray for me, it is we pray for one another because mm -hmm. we love one another. Mm -hmm. um, this weekend, I will be taking that, a trip that's to right. Longview. That's right. I get to meet my mentor face to face, and speak with her face to face, and touch and hug, mm -hmm. and have some time with her. I know it will be a good she time. Will be talking with others, but at least I will have a few moments. Get to say her. Hattie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, pray it's wonderful uh, for that trip, please. And pray for one another. Every one of us, every one of us needs the support of everyone else's prayers. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that you do pray for us. We yes. know you do. Yeah, we do. Um, mm -hmm. And we appreciate it. Thank y'all for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just bless yes. everyone. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that we are sons and servants of the Most High God. Father, thank you for this honor. Thank you for this privilege. We bless your people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. And we will be here next Tuesday. And you be with us. Mm -hmm. All so right. Invite somebody yeah. else to watch. Yes, invite somebody else. Because and next week, if the Lord, I don't know. Well, I won't say because I don't know where the Lord's we don't going. Know what's going to happen? I don't know. You never know. You have to show the, up. The, ra out. the rapture may be between right. here we next may not Tuesday. Even so, be here. so anyway, if we are, join us again, will you? All right. We love, love you. Good night. See you next week. Bye bye. <laughs>